Good morning. Good morning. The scripture this morning comes from James chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does, and not by faith alone.
difficult at times for us to hear the words, you know, you're really not doing that correctly. You're not doing that like it was supposed to be done, and you're not meeting our expectations with that. We it is difficult for us to hear that, that we're not doing something in the right way. And in the best terms, that's known as constructive criticism. We can read in 1 Corinthians how Paul gives the church in Corinth corrective criticism. They had not been partaking of the Lord's Supper in the correct manner. And so he goes back to how it was given to us as a model and an example. And so we can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with the first decree. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup. It is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink the cup, this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So he gave them a reminder. of the example that had been given to, given to them and given to all of us, in that this is the expectation when you partake of the Lord's Supper, the Lord you remember what Christ has done for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to remember your son, our Savior, sacrifice. And Father, as we partake of the slope, which represents Christ's body, may we do so in a manner well pleasing unto thee. In Jesus' name, amen.
this is a community time for us too. <laughs> and so as we think about the many blessings that we've been given, let's go to our Father. Dear Holy Father, thank you for everything that you've given us. We're so grateful for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us, both spiritually and physically. And Father, as we are mindful of those physical blessings, as we give back unto you, may we do so with a cheerful heart. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 One more song before the lesson. 548. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me, he's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. A million valley in him alone I see, all I need to quench and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my saint, he tells me every care. Died in a good old age, 
an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah near Mamre, in the field of Ephraim, son of Zahar the Hittite. The field Abraham had bought from the Hittites, there Abraham was buried with his wife Sarah. The Hebrew writer says, For it has been appointed for man to die, and then comes judgment. At the culmination of human life, and at the end, there is death. And the reason for that is given by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5. And so what we see Abraham doing here is the way that all men and women will go. And that is the way of death. But as I, as I have mentioned before, and I'm going to continue to mention, just because we are no longer part of the physical experience doesn't mean that all of us is gone. In fact, there are pieces of us left behind. This is what's called a legacy. A legacy, according to Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary 11th edition, says that a legacy is something transmitted by or received from an ancestor or predecessor. Abraham, as we saw in the book of James in our scripture reading, Abraham is an ancestor to Christians. But what is it about Abraham that would constitute a legacy for the Christian? That is what we're going to discuss today because one thing we notice when you read through the Gospels is that the Gospel is full of examples of Jews and their justification of their disbelief in Jesus being predicated upon the fact of how they are the sons of Abraham. Now, the thing that always struck me kind of, I, I shouldn't say humorous, but in a way it is, because they kept telling Jesus, well, we're the sons of Abraham. Well, so was Jesus. Jesus, like them, was a Jew. But do you know that many Jews today, unfortunately, continue in this mindset because they will not give their life to Christ. For example, Barry Horner wrote a book. He wrote two volumes. One is called The Future of Israel, and the next one is called Eternal Israel. But in the book Future Israel, in his introductory comments, he mentions a Jewish scholar by the name of Moshe. And Moshe alleges that Christians have committed identity theft in the sense of how Christians teach, as the New Testament teaches, and we're going to see that today, that the Christians are the new people of God. Unfortunately, Mr. Horner in his book agrees with that assessment. He not only goes with that premise in the first volume, but he also continues it, and even more blatantly so, in the second volume of his work. In fact, I want to read some comments he makes from his introduction in his second volume called Eternal Israel. <laughs> He says, in the contemporary world, one of the increasingly common crimes is to gain access to a person's credit card and thus to usurp their good name, to take over the identity and credit of another person. It is quite similar for Christ-following Jews or Gentiles to take over the same, to take over, excuse me, the name of the Jew. Claiming there is no one else who truly answers to this description, name and identity, better than they. 
Of course, this fraudulently solves the Jewish problem. All real Jews would or should have become Christ followers, and since there are no real Jews other than those in Christ, and their fellow Gentile Christ followers in Judaism has effectively been displaced, taken over, and dismantled. But then his last statement is what was more appalling than any of this other dribble of his. He says, yes, there has been identity theft committed by the Christian church that needs to be exposed and rectified. Is he right? And that's what I want to look at today in this lesson. As we look at Abraham's legacy, what it exactly is Abraham's legacy? You know, the Jews believe that Abraham's legacy to them was that they were the exclusive and chosen people of God. And we see they were the custodians of the law. And it would be that through that seed of Abraham, that those seeds rather, as the Apostle Paul will explain to us in Galatians 3, that they were the custodians of law. Abraham was the progenitor of the race that Christ would come to fruition through. But did this make them exclusive? And that's what we want to answer. I want us to go to the promises that were specifically made to Abraham very quickly in Genesis 12, verses 2 through 3. Notice how a few underlines I have up here to show that Abraham's legacy is not exactly what the Jews in Jesus' day thought this legacy was. In Genesis 12, 2 and 3, notice how God says that He would make of Abraham a great nation. And then He says, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So through this nation, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. In Genesis 13, verses 15 and 16, this nation would be made up of offspring, notice, like the dust of the earth. The offspring could not be counted. Now we have a pretty good indication about the time of, of Solomon and Hezekiah. We have a pretty good indication of how many people lived in Israel at that time. So again, my premise is, is this talking about the Jews specifically. In Genesis 15 and verse 5, we say, For God tells Abraham to look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, notice, so shall your offspring be. Genesis 18 and verse 18, another phrase, All nations on earth will be blessed through him. This is when God was asking those who had accompanied him if he should tell Abraham what he was going to do regarding Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 22, verses 17 and 18. This reference we have, once again, make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. How do these promises affect me as a Christian? Did you notice words used in these passages? Your seed. All nations will be blessed through you. Your offspring will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And if the sands on the seashore could be counted, so shall the number of your descendants be. I bear in mind to you the fact that as the Apostle Paul is going to teach us in Galatians 3, what Abraham was promised was not only a posterity. 
And that posterity, of course, would be the nation of Israel. But most importantly, it would be how God would use the nation of Israel to bring Christ the Redeemer into the world. It would be through that seed the world would be blessed. These promises that we have read about and studied in this series on the life of Abraham is in fact important to you and I as a Christian. And let us go to the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 3 verses 6 through 9. Let us go to the Apostle Paul and let him answer the query of the morning. Are Christians the legacy of Abraham? In Galatians 3, verses 6 through 9, it says, So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now notice what Paul says. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. I want to read that again. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Notice what the Apostle Paul is teaching us here. We need to take the example of Abraham and we need to replicate that in our life. Why? Because Abraham was a man of faith. We become Christians through faith. Just as Abraham believed and it was accredited to him as righteousness, when we believe and put on Christ in baptism, we are looked upon as righteous in the sight of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, notice how the Apostle Paul explains this wonderful gift. He says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Regarding faith and the development thereof, go to Romans 1, 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. When we first hear the gospel, that faith to faith is talking about the development of a faith that will lead to obedience. When we first hear the gospel, we have to create a system of belief so that we can respond to that belief. But what is faith? Notice Hebrews 11 and verse 1. The inspired writer tells us, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So as we build faith, as we listen to the gospel, as we listen to that good news, we can't see it outside of the printed page. We can't hear it outside of hearing somebody read scripture to us or teach us about the Bible. But we believe. We believe. Notice James 2, 23 and 24, which brings us to the point that the Apostle Paul is making in Galatians 3. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works. And not by faith only. Now what's James talking about here? Here he is laying the premise 
that faith without works is dead. It takes both. And we're going to talk about that relationship right now. True faith will lead one into demonstrating belief through obedient action. So as we hear the gospel being proclaimed, and as we start building a system of belief, that belief, if developed correctly, is going to move us to action. Move us to that obedience. The act of obedience is not some separate work. And that's exactly what Paul is teaching in Galatians 3. What James is teaching in James 2. But it becomes joined with faith as one to demonstrate an obedient response to the command of God that one has come to believe. And that is why Mark 16 and verse 16, the words of our Savior, when it comes to the adherence of the gospel, verse 16, for whosoever believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but whosoever does not believe shall be condemned. You see, we develop a faith to where we develop belief. That belief leads us to a response, and that response makes us a child of that faith, a child of God. And that faith, if we continue in steadfastness, will continue to be with us until we pass from this life and enter into eternal life from faith to faith. Wow. Isn't this a wonderful message? Abraham did the same thing. God told Abraham, leave your country, leave your relatives, and I want you to go to a place I will show you. Abraham had never, uh, Abraham had never interacted with God before, but yet what did Abraham do? He believed he packed up and what he went. But the most powerful example of Abraham's belief is found in when he, God told him, I want you to take your one, I want you to take your only son Isaac, and I want you to go to a place I will show you, and there I want you to sacrifice your son to me. The scriptures tell us that Abraham, what did he do? He packed up and he went. Why? The Hebrew writer tells us because he believed that God could raise his son from the dead. He believed God. And that's what moved him to obedience. If you are a Christian this morning, you went through these same steps. You went through these same steps. You Within your study, you created a system of belief and the Spirit was guiding you through the Word. And you created this, this system of belief and then all of a sudden you thought to yourself, oh, now I get it. It is time to make Christ my Lord. And you did that when you had your sins washed away by the power of His atonement. Galatians 3, verses 11 to 14. The message of Christianity is that of saving grace and needed mercy. Notice the Apostle Paul. No one is justified by the law, and the sight of God is evident. What's Paul saying here? Romans 3 verse 23 is how he would answer that question. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For all have sinned, but there was one who didn't sin. That of course being Jesus. But when Jesus was put on that cross, cursed is the man who hangeth upon the tree, said the Old Testament prophet. Jesus became that curse. He became that sin offering so you and I would not incur the wrath of God. That's where the justification comes in. Being declared righteous because of the shedding of the blood of our Savior. And that is why the Apostle Paul says the just 
shall live by faith. And it's not just the Apostle Paul being Mr. Philosopher here. No, and holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is telling Paul to write to us that the just shall live by faith. And he continues. Yet the law is not of faith. But the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And notice he continues by saying that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The promise of the Spirit through faith. In John chapter 20 and verse 31, <laughs> the inspired John tells us the premise of the entire gospel message. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Or the whole Bible actually. When he says... That these things have been written that ye may believe and have life in His name. When you go to Galatians chapter 4, verses 22 through 31, and unfortunately, we do not have time to go through that rich text, but you will see where it is an allegory. And it's an allegory that explains in figurative language the action that has taken place as the Hebrew writer teaches in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 12 for the priesthood being changed of necessity there must be a change of law also Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount I have come to fulfill the law and the prophets did he do that? yes he did it by being nailed on the cross with the Lord. It has been fulfilled. There's no more need for the Mosaical law. It has been fulfilled and now the law of Christ has been put into place by Almighty God. Because of this change, God has declared the law of Christ as the measuring rod of judgment. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, the Apostle Paul writes, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. When we are judged on that great judgment day, it will not be according to the measure of the law of Moses. It will not be according to the Ten Commandments. It will be according to the law of Christ. That is the major wrong of judgment. Is everyone going to be measured by that? Even those who, who are Jews today? Yes. For we will all stand before the judgment seat. Christ. All of mankind will be adjudicated by the law of Christ. Those who go to heaven, it will be by the law of Christ. For those who will meet their doom in the fires of condemnation, that will also be by the law of Christ. But isn't it a blessing to know that through the law of Christ that as a Christian we have been given a spirit of liberty. A spirit of freedom. Because no man can keep the law. The Apostle Paul says, for well, that is evident. No man can keep the law. There is only one who could. That was Jesus. Galatians 3, 16 through 18 as we focus back on Abraham. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And he does not say and to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to your seed. And notice this. 
The Apostle Paul continues, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise that God gave it to Abraham. By promise. Once again, that seed that Abraham was promised, was it a posterity? Yes. But a posterity culminating in the greatest event of human history, the event of Jesus dying on the cross for you and for me and for all who come to believe and be baptized in His name. Let's go now to Galatians 3, 26-29. What, what is the conclusion, Brother Paul? What is, what is the conclusion, Brother? What, how, how am I to synthesize this information so that it will positively affect my life? Brother Paul responds, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is, either, there is neither excuse me, Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Genesis 22 verse 18, that in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. In your seed, the Apostle Paul said that seed was Christ. The gospel has come to the Jew as well as to the Gentile. Thanks be to God. Because it means that I can be saved. It means that you can be saved. It means that anybody who we come into contact with can be saved. Thanks be to God. It means that when a Jewish person will submit themselves to Christ, they will be saved as well. Thanks be to God. What, what a legacy. The promise of Christ was given to Abraham first as a promise. Christ and the Christianity that comes by him is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise. How exciting this is. It's exciting to know that as a Christian, we are the legacy of Abraham. We are the legacy of Abraham. John 12, verses 30 through 32. Jesus said this to the hearing of the Jews he was speaking to. This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Jesus asked for God to glorify him. God glorified him, and the people around him heard it as that of thunder. Once an old angel was speaking to him. Jesus responded, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, notice this, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. To end this morning, let's look at how Christ drew all people to himself. First Peter chapter 2, verses 5 through 10. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he 
is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, they stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and to his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but have now obtained. Amen. Has Christianity committed identity theft, according to the, the theologian that we started with? No. No, we haven't committed identity theft. But what we are is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise. You and I, if you're a Christian this morning, you and I are in fact the legacy of Abraham. So let us go about our week, our month, our year in a way that exemplifies the wonderful attributes that made up Abraham's character. Let us learn from those good things. Also, let us learn from his mistakes so that we would not repeat them. You are the legacy of Abraham. This morning we offer an invitation. Maybe there is someone among us that now you see it. Now you know. Now you are ready to confess Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're ready to put Him on in baptism. Friend, if you're ready to do that today, we are ready to help you. We would love to celebrate with you. We'd love to add you. We would love <coughs> to celebrate as Christ adds you to His people today. Maybe there's a Christian among us that life has you down. You need some encouragement. You need to know that someone loves you. You need to know that someone cares. Brother, sister, we do. Let us show you how much we love and care for you. Would you please let us pray for you? Pray for you. If anyone needs to answer this invitation, shepherds as well as myself we will be waiting in back to your seat please go to them as we stand and sing our invitation song
Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Just want to remind you that we are picking up a bulletin. There's a lot of things that are going on in there. Um, schedule at a glance. Things that are going on, even though the virus takes its toll on gatherings. But anyway, there's an opportunity there, uh, different places that you can be a part of. I'm gonna put a plug in for something we're gonna do. We did this last month, it was the uh, little Devo. It's uh, all-inclusive congregational Devo on a Wednesday night. We don't have Wednesday night classes per se, uh, but we're gonna have that on the 19th, that's a week and a half away. I encourage everyone to be there. And it's songs, it's a lesson. We're going to have a little cup of ice cream afterwards. It's an opportunity to uh, just have a Bible study, just to encourage each other, uh, just to be here on Wednesday. Uh, we're trying to get things started back up so that we can get back into the groove of what the Lord wants us to do, the things that we need to do to be edified, to be strengthened by studying the Word. So I encourage you. In that vein, I've also got a card this morning from Julie Clayson. She wants you to RSVP this. This is concerning the teens. This is this coming Wednesday, the 12th, at Jeff and Tracy Lawns. They're going to have a uh, team Evo at 172 South Brenda. If I get this wrong, you just check with one of those two sitting right there. Hot dogs are provided. Youth. Bring chips, um, and, and it says your team brings sodas and dessert. So it's a it's a, a team and youth gathering. So it's a good thing for there, and it's not your really, building; it's at their place out there in the country. So a good time looking to be had there. Have also a, a prayer sent in from Julie. She says here, uh, please pray for me as I have uh, a, T, a CT scan. CT. Monday to look at uh, pancreas. So hopefully she'll know more about that uh, after that scan. There's lots of folks in the bulletin that we need to have in our regular prayers. I uh, hope you're doing that and taking care of those needs to our Father in Heaven, uh, raising them in prayer, as well as the situation we are in this United States concerning the virus. It's good, like I said, to see everyone here. We know that there are many that want to be here but can't. So we continue to pray for them, give them the strength, give them a call maybe, let them know that we still know that you're out there. That being said, as we always do, we have a closing prayer. It ends our services this morning. If you can stand, let's get ready for you. I also want to let you know that Randy did be traveling with family down in Arkansas and kind of the last hit the summer gathering there. I know the summer doing that maybe before school starts. Get ready back back into the, into the groove. So let's remember those who travel also. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just uh, thankful that uh, we can be here to worship you. To we be here to encourage each other edified and be uplifted by your word. Uh, we're just thankful for the promise of heaven because of Jesus that is in our lives. Um, I just pray that we have truly worship you as your word says to do so in spirit and truth. Um, I just pray that also that uh, our time together has been a blessing to each other. Father, you are a refuge and strength. And I know that you help us through the difficulties of life. This time, this virus has taken control of many things in our lives. I just pray that we would not get downhearted and depressed, but keep joy in our lives, looking to you for that strength and that guidance. Also pay for 
pray for patience and endurance through it all. Um, just pray that we always keep you in our lives to keep us in, give us that strength. Also, if we become forgetful, that you uh, forgive us. I just pray that we would not lean on our own understanding in anything, that we would always lean upon you and your word. Always pray for unity and the work of the Lord here in Salina, in whatever matter that we can be a part of. We just know that we are stronger together than we are apart. I just pray that we can overcome Satan's darts in our lives as we learn it. Ron's lesson this morning, morning about how he deceives. He's a deceptor. He doesn't want the very best for us. He wants us to pull us apart from you. For those who are in our minds and our hearts who are not with us, who are dealing with illnesses, who are in our, our prayer list, on this bulletin, I just, just pray that you would uh, comfort and heal to those who are needed. those who are overcoming illnesses continue to strengthen them. Father, now I just want to ask you to guard our hearts and our minds as we look to you, as we leave this place, as we go into the world. This coming week, uh, we just pray that we will drift away, we'll just remain strong in all things. Thanks to you, Father, for your wonderful love and your grace. And your Son, and it's in His name we pray. Amen.